if not better. And uh, the programming is outstanding, and there is literally something for everyone. So uh, uh, please take a look at that information. Uh, several announcements this morning. Uh, June Hess here is going to talk with us about peacemaking. Good morning. Good morning. On October 5th, we will celebrate World Communion Sunday and receive our annual peacemaking offering. This year's peacemaking theme is Faith Connects. The biblical reference is, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Jesus' words from John 14, verse 27. As Christians, we are connected by this amazing gift of peace. It empowers us to seek nonviolent solutions to conflict, provides opportunities to give witness to God's love, to engage our imaginations, to search with others for ways to live into our calling to be peacemakers. How are we to live authentically as Christians in this world? First Presbyterian Winchester is a church committed to peacemaking our session approved the General Assembly commitment to peacemaking back in 1980 and reaffirmed the commitment in 2008. The peacemaking team, which is part of the Mission Council, regularly seeks to discern our congregation's special call to be peacemakers. Each year, 25% of the offering stays in our community. Last, year, last year's local offering was used to sponsor the speaker at the 6th Annual Community Commitment for Change Conference. The conference focused on drug addiction and its impact on our community. Over 300 people who work in the front lines with addiction and, the, and its impact came together for that day, looking, seeking better ways to serve those who struggle with this issue. The peacemaking team has also been active in presenting opportunities for education about and discussions on gun violence. As our congregation's response to this issue evolves, the team continues to support these conversations. We are also actively preparing a community forum to be held next January on the topic of modern slavery and human trafficking. There'll be more about this in a few weeks. The Christian experience is a life held in the balance between Jesus' words that the kingdom of God is among you and of the reality that we fall far short of that vision. Still, we can bear bold witness to the peaceable kingdom in concrete actions here and now. Remember, 25% of the peacemaking offering remains in our community, and this year it will help fund our January forum. 25% of it will be used by our Presbyterian initiatives, and 50% will go to Presbyterian peacemaking ministries, with which, by the way, our own David Falman Smith's countless hours. Your gifts to the peacemaking offering will help our local community, the Valley communities, and our world know that God's sovereign reign of peace does reside among us, even in the midst of a violence-torn world. Gifts really do change the world. Please be generous with yours. June, thank you and your team. And now Sarah Gardner is going to talk with us. Uh, a moment for stewardship. So Sarah, welcome. Um, good morning, my name is Sarah Gardner and I'm here to speak on behalf of the stewardship campaign for the year. Um, I'd like to start out with a little riddle. Um, how is First Presbyterian like Golden Corral? <clears throat> we have something for everyone. And I was actually thinking about it during the uh, 8.30 service, and I was listening too, I promise. But um, the other way that I was thinking is that for some reason, no matter what time you drive by, the parking lot is always full. So that's the other way that I was thinking they were similar. Um, the stewardship uh, committee is asking for your assistance in our planning this year. Um, I would appreciate it very much if you could take a walk through the gathering area on your way out. There are a bunch of index cards near a box and the box has a big heart on it and it says FPC on it. Um, you know, if I asked you what is your favorite thing to eat at Golden Corral, you might have an answer like that. 
but I would like to ask you a little bit more difficult question. What is your favorite thing or what is the best thing that you love about First Presbyterian? If you could give it some thought and if you would sort of write an answer on one of these cards and drop it in the box, I would really appreciate it. You don't have to put your name on it. Um, and just like at Golden Corral, you can contribute or take as much or as little as you would like, but please make sure that you give us some of your input. Thanks so much. Sarah, thank you very much. And now um, Rich, and uh, he's gonna invite two very special folks forward. So. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God.
Let us join together in the responsive call to worship. People of God, we are together to worship and pray. Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, has taught us how to pray. The Holy Spirit engages with our spirit to pray as we ought. Our Heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to all who ask. Let us pray. God of all grace, you have given us minds to know you and hearts to love you and voices to sing your praises. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Confident in God's mercy and forgiveness, let us now confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. O oh, compassionate God, Jesus our Savior, it is so easy for us to rattle off your great commandment to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, yet we do not live it. Instead of loving you, we love the gods of our own making. Instead of loving our neighbor, we exploit, ignore, betray, and disregard one another. We are quick to judge others and slow to consider our dis disobedience. Yet you see us clearly. Convict our hearts as only you can. Love us into a new way of being, the way that you have commanded. Amen. Amen. Hear now the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, and the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And so friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen.
Be seated, please. This time I would like to invite the children forward for our children's moment. Today we're learning about the prayer that Jesus taught, and we call that prayer now the Lord's Prayer. And so one of the parts of that prayer teaches us um, that we should pray for the world to become the way God wants it to be. Um, so in my bag, I brought a world. Hmm. But it's not quite the way it's supposed to be. It doesn't quite look right, does it? Hmm. Well, you know, this world that I'm holding might remind us that God's world doesn't, isn't quite the way it's supposed to be either. Um, there are lots of things happening in our world that God um, doesn't want to be happening. So there are people who are hungry and without food. There are people who are fighting and people who are hurting. But the, the world we live in is not the way it's supposed to be. So it doesn't look like it should. Um, but as God's kingdom grows, it will become the way God wants it to be. And so there's something very important that we can do um, as part of that. We can pray for the world to be more like God wants it to be. Um, so I thought one example of that might be that we could pray for people all around the world who don't have food to eat. So and as we pray... God will help it happen, and the world will be a little bit closer to being the way God wants it to be. So what's another way we could pray for our world? How can we pray for our world? To, for, for people to be nice to each other. That's a great way we can pray. So not just even here or in our lives, but all over the world that people will be nice to each other. All right. Katie, what's another way? We can give other people food, and that's a way um, we can pray for that to happen, and we can take part in that to make our world be a little bit more the way God wants it to be. Well, what's another way we can pray for our world? We can pray for people to have good, clean water. You're right. And the world becomes a little bit closer to the way it's supposed to be. Pray for people who are sick all around the world. There are a lot of people dealing with very serious sicknesses in our world today. And so we can pray for them to be better. So we can, we can pray for leaders around the world to make decisions that honor God. Um, we can pray for there to be no more war, that people would be kind to one another and no longer fighting. Um, but so we talked about some prayers, and there are many, many more prayers that we could pray but still our, world, still our world isn't quite the way it's supposed to be. It looks better. Hold on one second. I'm running, I'll, get, I'll take your question. So, so our world looks a little bit better than it did when we first started. But it's not quite there yet, is it? It still, still isn't quite the way it's supposed to be. And I think that's true of God's world. So as we pray, it becomes more and more until we pray for the day that God's world will be exactly the way God wants it to be. It'll be perfect the way God created it at the beginning, all right? So our globe is going to stay like this to remind us that we need to keep praying um, for God's world to be the way that God wants it to be, all right? And what's your, did you have a question? Hey, she's in my class. She is in your <laughs> class. All right, well, let, how about we say a prayer in the congregation if you pray along with us? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. your kingdom come, your will, be done. your will be done. We pray for the needs and problems here on earth. We pray for the world to become more like you want. Amen. 
All right. Thank you all very much for coming and joining. The children may return to their families or go out to Wee Wan's worship. And as they are doing that, let us take a few moments to greet our neighbors beside whom we are worshiping. We are continuing our sermon series on the kingdom of God. Uh, it's what Jesus preached, it's what he uh, embodied, and he calls those who follow him and bear, bear his name uh, to do likewise. And the lesson this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, reading verses uh, five through 13, and this is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the setting is somewhat different uh, from Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, it doesn't show up in what is the Sermon on the Plain. Um, here in Matthew's gospel, the Lord's Prayer shows up in the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, the disciples see Jesus praying, and they come to him, and they say, um, we've noticed that John the Baptist has taught his disciples to pray. Teach us. Um, but here in Matthew's gospel, uh, the the prayer shows up in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in a section where Jesus is contrasting sincere piety with insincere piety. So hear now uh, the word of God, Matthew, the sixth chapter, reading verses five and following. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, 
and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This past week I was trying to recall who taught me the Lord's Prayer or how old I was when I first learned it. I couldn't do either one. (laughs) It was a long time ago, I know that, and what now seems like not only another time but another land as well. I suspect that over the past half century, I have prayed the Lord's Prayer several thousands of times. The Lord's Prayer for me is like the melody of a familiar tune. It's in my mind and heart. It's under my skin. I know it through and through. This can be a good thing but it also can be a bad thing. The good thing is that it is an integral part of the practice of my Christian faith. The words are right there in the front of my mind, on the tip of my tongue, at the top of my heart. I can call them up and pray them on a moment's notice. When I don't know what else to say to God, I say the words of the Lord's Prayer. If I were a Buddhist, it would be my mantra. Now the bad thing is that the prayer and its words may have grown too familiar. I have worn the sharper cutting edges off of them with use. They have grown perhaps too smooth. Now the Lord's Prayer is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. So the sixth chapter opens with Jesus contrasting sincere piety and insincere piety. Piety is a wonderful word used to describe our religious devotion. Jesus teaches his disciples about three principal expressions of piety, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Almsgiving is our act of religious devotion in relationship to neighbors who need us. Prayer is an act of our religious devotion in our relationship with God. And fasting is our religious devotion in our relationship to ourselves, especially our physical appetites. The poster children for insincere piety are the hypocrites. If you haven't noticed, Jesus' harshest criticism in the Gospels is reserved for the hypocrites. Another target of his criticism is the Gentiles, that would be all of the non-Jews. To Jesus' way of thinking, the hypocrites are the ones who pray for show. They don't mean it. They just want others to see them in prayer and think well of them. That appears to be their motivation. They want to be seen and known and admired as pious people. 
The hypocrites reason that since prayer is a pious thing to do, as many as people as possible should see us praying so that they won't miss the point of how very pious we are. So the busiest street corner in town would be an ideal spot. Jesus holds up the hypocrites as bad examples of how not to pray. In other words, don't do it like that. Now the Gentiles are bad examples of how not to pray as well. According to Jesus, their words are empty, hollow. The Gentiles have reasoned that one should pile word upon word upon word upon word upon word upon word in prayer. They valued quantity over quality. They felt obligated to tell God everything as if God was somehow oblivious to the human condition in general and their human condition in particular. Then Jesus tells his disciples to pray then in this way. And he gives to them, he gives to us the Lord's Prayer. Now the Lord's Prayer has been the model prayer for followers of Jesus since the very earliest days of the Christian faith. The prayer has been dissected, it's been commented on, it's been interpreted in countless uh, times and ways across two millennia. Here's a description of the prayer that I have found useful over the years. Leander Keck of Yale Divinity School writes, prayer is an honest conversation with a parent in heaven during which anything can be expressed. The Lord's Prayer is the model prayer, shows quite clearly that in this conversation, God is not ignorant, waiting to be informed. Rather, the Heavenly Father knows we need bread. We need forgiveness, that we are vulnerable in times of trial, that we are exposed to the power of evil. Prayer is not an occasion to inform God. Prayer is an occasion to express our trust in God. Now the Lord's Prayer has three God petitions and four human petitions. Today I want us to focus on the two God petitions, namely your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does it mean for us to pray first and foremost before we offer any other petition using the Lord's Prayer for God's kingdom to come? for God's will to be done. For starters, I believe it's a confession as followers of Christ that we are disenchanted by, that we are dissatisfied with the present kingdom and its apparent will. It has become increasingly clear to us that the way things are are not the way things are supposed to be. After all, we have experienced the grace of God and Jesus Christ and have glimpsed what life can be. We have glimpsed what life should be. There's a word for it. It's called the pinch. There's the way the world is and there is the way we yearn for the world to be. As Christians in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, the world we yearn for is the world Jesus has portrayed for us, especially in the Sermon on the Mount and the parables of the kingdom of God. The pinch is the pain or the discomfort we feel when we settle for the world as it is rather than praying and working for the world that God is birthing. Brian McLaren in his book, The Secret Message of Jesus, has this to say about the kingdom of God. He writes, 
The kingdom of God then is a revolutionary counter-cultural movement proclaiming a ceaseless rebellion against the tyrannical trinity of money, sex, and power. Its citizens resist the occupation of this invisible Caesar through three categories of spiritual practice. First, they practice a liberating generosity toward the poor to dethrone greed and topple the regime of money. Second, they practice a kind of prayer that is a defiant act of resistance against the prideful pursuit of power, pursuing instead forgiveness and reconciliation and not retaliation and revenge. Finally, they practice fasting to revolt against the dominating impulses of physical gratification so that the sex drive and other physical appetites will not become our slave drivers. And all of these are practiced covertly, in secret, so they aren't corrupted into an external show as the hypocrites do. Now if I understand McLaren, the drivers of our world are money, sex, power. When I pick up my morning newspaper or peruse the headline of my online news feed, I believe he has it pretty close to right. What sells? What motivates? What determines decisions? It's money. It's sex. It's power. And those who have it want to keep it and get some more. Those who don't want it, who don't have it, and will do anything to get it. This was true in Jesus' day. It's true in our day. It will be true at history's end, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not God's way. Also, if I understand McLaren correctly, the drivers of God's reign, God's kingdom, God's world and heaven and God's world that has come and is coming into our world, which we pray for and live into in the Lord's Prayer, the drivers are generosity. Forgiveness, reconciliation, self-denial. McLaren suggests in that piece that I shared with us that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are committing an act of resistance. Now imagine that. I've seen Christians, heads bowed in reverence, reciting the words to an ancient prayer in unison. It doesn't sound like an act of resistance. It doesn't look like an act of resistance. In some societies, it is. But in ours, not really. However, maybe it doesn't sound or feel or look like an act of resistance because I have been co-opted and perhaps you have as well. Perhaps I no longer feel the pinch. Perhaps you no longer feel the pinch. One particular passage from the 1969 novel Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut has stuck with me since I first read the book four decades ago. Vonnegut wrote Slaughterhouse Five to help himself make sense of World War II. Vonnegut, a young U.S. Army infantryman, um, was captured at the Battle of the Bulge and was a prisoner of war in an underground slaughterhouse in Dresden, Germany. At the time, the Allied forces firebombed the city in retaliation for the German firebombing campaign of London. Vonnegut writes, and this is the narrator in his novel speaking, America is the wealthiest nation on earth, but its people are mainly poor. And poor Amer Americans are urged to hate themselves. To quote the American humorist Ken Hubbard, it ain't no disgrace to be poor, 
but it might as well be. It is in fact a crime for an American to be poor even though America is a nation of poor. Every other nation has folk traditions of men who were poor but extremely wise and virtuous and therefore more estimable than anyone with power and gold. No such tales are told by the American poor. They mock themselves and glorify their betters. The meanest eating and drinking establishment owned by a man who himself is poor is very likely to have a sign on its wall asking this cruel question, if you're so smart, why ain't you rich? Now I recalled this passage when I began thinking of the Lord's Prayer more and more as an act of resistance. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are aligning ourselves with God's reign, a reign that is very, very different than the one to which we have grown acculturated, the one to which we have grown accustomed. In God's reign, God's kingdom, what matters most is not money or stuff or even ideas or one's theology. It's people, people. In the present reign, the highest value appears to be a whole host of things and one of them isn't necessarily people. Now 16th century Protestant reformer Martin Luther published his small catechism in 1529. The catechism is sought to train children in the faith. The questions were to be asked and then answered around a dinner table. And if you're not familiar with the catechism, I commend it to you. And uh, so we're, we're going to have to do a little bit of role playing. You know, th this, this is one big dinner table. You got that? Okay, you're all around it, and I'm standing at the head, and I'm going to say a piece of the Lord's Prayer, and then I'm going to feed you the question, and you're going to say it out loud, and then I'm going to use Luther, Luther's catechism. And it's the two petitions of the Lord's Prayer we're looking at this morning. Thy kingdom come. Now you're supposed to say, what does this mean? The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. And now you're supposed to say, how does God's kingdom come? How does God's, kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. And then the next petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and you are to ask, what does this mean? The good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be done among us also, and you are to ask, how is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die, this is his good and gracious will. I find it difficult saying it any better than Martin Luther. God's kingdom comes with or without me. It comes with or without my prayer. But I pray the prayer because I want to be a part of its coming. You pray the prayer because you want to be a part of its coming. We long to be included in what God is up to. God's will will be done with or without me but I pray the prayer because I want to be part of God's will being done. You pray the prayer because you want to be a part of God's will being done. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are renouncing our citizenship in the world's kingdom and pledging our allegiance as citizens in another, God's kingdom. 
That is an act of resistance. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are turning from following the world's fruitless and destructive will and turning to following God's fruitful and constructive will. That is an act of resistance. In the words of perhaps the most significant Christian theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, the, claps, the clasping of the hand in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. That is an act of resistance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's now our privilege to go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of all grace, we pray that you would draw near to us as we draw near to you. Lord, we do not know always what we should say but we know that your spirit intercedes for us, speaking the words that need to be said. You know every desire of our heart and every care of our life. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would shine your light into our dark places, that as we stumble, that you would walk along beside us and that when we are lost, your love will find us. Oh God, we come before you bringing our prayers for our world. We pray, O oh Lord, for your peace to come, for your will to be done, for your kingdom to come. We pray for an end of, of warfare and bloodshed. We pray for an end of famine and disease. We pray especially for those nations with deep unrest, facing great trials and struggles. We pray for Syria and for Ukraine and for Sierra Leone. Lord, we pray for our nation, 
for its leaders, and we pray, O oh Lord, for its enemies. Lord, we pray for our community, for the homeless men, women, and children, for those who are out of work, for those who struggle to find a safe, clean place to live, for those who are struggling with addiction and mental illness and depression. We pray also for the family members who walk beside them. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering this day. We pray for Dottie Edwards undergoing cancer treatment. And pray, O oh Lord, that you'd bring healing and strength to her body. And Lord, we bring before you now all those people who are on our hearts, those we love, who are struggling and suffering. We bring them before you in silence now. Lord, we ask that your healing presence would be with them and that they would know your love and your comfort. Oh Lord, these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Remembering the words of our Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive, let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Please be seated.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen.